Okay, the computer there says bootable device not found, blah, 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 but we don't need no stinking computers today. <laughs> so what we will be dealing with is the specifics of magnetic resonance and we start with the behavior of a magnetic moment that you put into a magnetic field. So things like compass arrows, things like tiny magnetite particles, and in the limit of classical physics, the dynamics of spin. Specifically the kind of dynamics that people use in MRI, where it's rarely necessary to actually consider things like J-couplings and dipole-dipole interactions and other things like that. And uh, the magnetic moments of protons in water are to a good approximation just classical magnetic moments. So once again I will be relying on a bit of electrodynamics. If you had it, good. If you didn't, take my word for it. But when you put a magnetic moment into a field, so magnetic moment in a field, it experiences a torque. And that torque is the cross product of the magnetic moment itself with the magnetic field. So we have the moment which is a vector, we have the field which is a vector, we then have a torque. And this is something that should have been derived to you in A levels physics. So this comes from the textbook. The second thing that comes from the textbook is the equation of motion for an angular momentum that is subject to a torque. This is called rotational Newton uh, equation, so essentially a reformulation of Newton's second law for rotational dynamics and uh, dj by dt where j is an angular momentum is just equal to that torque. And now what we do is we remember our very first lecture where I have shown you that for a nucleus the spin isn't actually spin, it's the total angular momentum of the nuclear ground state. And so we can use these classical equations in combination with that observation from the previous lecture. Uh, we know that our uh, nucleus has mu equal gamma j, right, where gamma is the magnetogenic ratio. So we plug that into these classical equations of motion and let us see what is going to happen. So we have dj by dt, so that is that. We put the tau into there, so mu cross b, so we have combined that equation and that equation and finally uh, we observe that we have this relationship and so what that then becomes is d by dt of the magnetic moment will be equal to gamma mu cross b. And that is called Bloch equations. They will acquire further terms as we go along. There will be terms that govern the return of the magnetization to the thermal equilibrium. But for now, these are our equations. And uh, so far, so obscure, we've just done a little bit of classical physics. So let us take a good look at those equations and at what they mean. Let us consider First, the very common case when the magnetic field is vertical. You've seen those magnets in the previous lecture. You remember that the magnetic field points either vertically up or in fact vertically down, depending on the manufacturer uh, on which direction they energize the coil in. So our field B will be 0 on x, 0 on y, and just some component on z. And because there will be also other fields in the system, eventually radio frequency magnetic fields, it is common to put a zero in here to remind ourselves that this field pertains to our big magnet. So this is our 14 Tesla. 
Okay, and let us plug that in and find out the equations of motion for the x, y, and z components of this magnetic moment. So that goes in, and we have d by dt of mu x mu y mu z written out explicitly, and that is the magnetic gyric ratio. Then once again, mu x mu y mu z cross product with 0 0 b naught we remember the expression for the cross product it's a determinant so i j k for the three coordinate directions then the first vector mu x mu y mu z then the second vector 0 0 b naught not forgetting the gamma multiplier in front. And so what that is then is, okay, i times mu y times b naught goes into the x. So mu y b naught. Then here the other component is 0. Then for the j, the component that goes with the plus is 0, the component that goes with the minus is mu x b naught, so minus mu x b naught, and for the k component we have the 0 here and the 0 there, so 0. And again in front of that we have our magnetogyric ratio. Now remember also the definition of the Larma frequency that I gave you in the previous lecture. We have defined omega and it will inherit the symbol from the magnetic field. Omega naught was minus gamma b naught. And so we can make that substitution in here and eventually let us rewrite it all uh, beginning to end. So d by dt of mu x mu y mu z will be. So we have this gamma. Gamma b naught, b naught is minus omega naught. So that's minus omega naught. And then we have mu y here, mu x. And with a minus and a zero. And so in component notation d by dt mu x of t is minus omega naught mu y d by dt mu y of t is omega naught mu x and d by dt mu z of t is 0. And these equations you have already seen in the workshop that we had two days ago. Essentially just the explicit version of this neat little vector relation here. And you can see why vector calculus is occasionally to be preferred over the component notation because the component notation is quite big. Okay, this is not a mathematics module. We will not go and solve this. I will simply write out the solution and again in that workshop you had demonstrated that that equation is in fact a solution. You had substituted and put it in. You can sort of guess it from here. Look at it. If we have mu x we take a derivative, we get mu y and minus something pops out in front. And then we take another derivative and something pops out in front and we go back. Of course, that is the cosine and the sine. Right? So the derivative of a cos is minus sine. The derivative of a sine is plus cos. So this is what our solution is. So getting the solutions. So mu x of t is some number a cosine omega naught t plus phi. So I'm incorporating all the arbitrary constants as well that come out of the differential equation solution. So mu y 
of t is a sine omega naught t plus phi and then mu z of t is constant so some number b and to get my signs correctly here yes everything is fine and essentially a direct substitution demonstrates that this is in fact a solution to this equation let us look at it a bit more closely geometrically because we are going to need that picture for the subsequent discussion so i'll draw it here and then we will use it uh, for later so we have our system of coordinates right, so this is our x y and z right, so x y z quite important for the system co of coordinates to be right-handed so if you turn a corkscrew from x to y it should be moving in the direction of z if you get a left-handed coordinate system it's easy to get terribly confused with these vector diagrams and let us see what kind of dynamics that thing prescribes well we have some kind of vector that is pointing in some direction and that vector has the z component which is static uh, so this value here remains unchanged so pinned uh, that particular projection however the x and the y they oscillate right? cos and sine and so what we have here is rotational motion right? with the frequency omega so-called precession so this value here is b and the radius of this circle is a so if we draw the radius here that is a okay so this is the dynamics of a single magnetic moment in the absence of external perturbations what we will now do is a transformation that will make our subsequent life considerably easier because what is about to appear is all sorts of oscillating magnetic fields and they all oscillate at giant frequencies 600 megahertz or so and we do need to adapt this picture to those rapid oscillatory processes so what i'll do is i will take this vector and i will glue a camera to it and this is quite nice these days because everybody knows what a web camera is when i was an undergraduate there were no web cameras and the description of the rotating frame transformation was considerably harder okay we tune that camera to whatever Wi-Fi there is, we connect to it remotely and we look through it. It wouldn't see very much. It will see a rapidly rushing coordinate system past it, but the spin itself and all of its friends from the nearby molecules will appear mostly static. Right? There may be slightly different magnetic field that there is here compared to there in heterogeneous samples but the rapid motion that we have will not manifest itself in this rotating frame so our second item on the agenda today is rotating frame transformation Now remember that around this system we have electromagnetic coils of our probe, the stuff we had discussed in the previous lecture. So I am simplifying here a lot, but roughly speaking there will be a coil here and there will be a coil that is wound in the perpendicular direction there. So that is connected to the amplifier and that is grounded and this creates an oscillating magnetic field in the x direction that creates it in the y direction in the z direction we do not need it as it turns out and it's actually pretty hard to implement because it will start interfering with the magnet 
we now have those two fields and those fields oscillate at the same frequency as our spin. They are resonant with it. Let us write down the equations for those and then transform them into this rotating frame to see what is going to happen. Power field. And now this is the field that comes from the probe. So it is called B1 field will have no component on the z, but it will have oscillating components on x and y. Oscillating so as to be in tune with our spin, because we want to influence it somehow. And of course from quantum mechanics you remember that there has to be a frequency match between the particle and the external electromagnetic field for transitions to happen. But we are still here in the classical picture. Our field, if we draw it, will have some amplitude. B1 without the vector is the amplitude of it. And then we will also give it a cosine component, omega naught t plus phi, and a sine component, omega naught t plus phi, and the z component will be zero. Once again, that is the field that oscillates at some frequency, and this phi is simply the angle that the field had at time zero, in the so-called phase. If we now do the rotating frame transformation on this, this omega naught t will disappear, because we are looking through a camera which is already rotating with that frequency. So in the rotating frame, B1R will simply have the cos of phi and the sine of phi component and the amplitude term in front. So that's the arrow, that's the amplitude, and that is cosine phi, sine phi, and zero. That is depending on the initial phase what this B1 simply looks like in the rotating frame is as if it were a static field which is a considerable simplification imagine what we would have had to do if the entire thing was going round at 600 megahertz and then there would be rotating fields at 600 megahertz and all of that was talking to each other through that equation that would have been seriously complicated but now in the rotating frame, the oscillating spin and the oscillating field are relatively static with respect to each other. And so the physics will take its course and of course in the rotating frame our spin will now begin precessing also around this extra magnetic field that we have. And so let us take a look at what is going to happen in that rotating frame. Now consider a situation where this phi is equal to zero. Then in the rotating frame the cos will be one and the sine will be zero and the z is of course also zero. And so the field will be pointing on the x-axis of the rotating frame. X pulse, it's called. Drawing the diagram again. Z axis. And consider the spin that is initially on Z. So pointing vertically up like that. This is again x and y. If our magnetic field is pointing in the x direction, that is the field. So that is the B1 and that is our magnetic moment. Remember these equations. They still apply. The spin rotates around the applied magnetic field. Remember that 
the positive direction of rotation is counterclockwise in physics, but we have a sneaky minus uh, in there. Where was it? Uh, in the definition of the Larma frequency. And so our rotations will be clockwise around the field, so they will follow the corkscrew rule. We put a corkscrew here, and we turn it in such a way as to make it follow the magnetic field. Right? The direction of the corkscrew rotation, to screw it out in that direction, will tilt the spin onto the minus y axis. So what will happen is this will be tilted all the way there. And our new direction of the spin, after, for example, a 90 degrees rotation, will be on the negative direction of the y-axis in there. And it wouldn't take too long for that to happen. Typically, in a modern NMR instrument, this is microseconds. And at the end of the process, we have tilted the spin. Remember, this is rotating frame, so the entire picture keeps going around at 600 megahertz. So the real picture geometrically could be quite complicated, but this is the rotating frame. And so this is called an X pulse because the field is directed on X. It's called a pulse because it's quite short. It's a few microseconds. And notice what we have achieved. Previously, our magnetic moments were pointing in the Z direction. They had no transverse component, and so they could not induce any currents in our coils. The spins were undetectable. Now, after this pulse, we have tilted the spin into the XY plane. If we now allow it to evolve, just leave it alone, it will evolve under this equation, so this will kick in. Our Z component is now zero, so the last equation doesn't contribute. But the first two will just run their course. There will be an oscillating magnetic field in the XY plane. That oscillating magnetic field will induce currents in those coils. The currents will be sent by the circulator into the preamplifier, then through the filters, then through the amplifier, then into the the analog to digital converter from the previous lecture, and there you have, we have a signal. So this pulse is quite essential to excite our magnetization into an observable state. Let us consider a situation as well when we give a magnetic field pulse in a different phase. So if our initial phase, the offset from the very precise instrument clock was by one quarter of the period of the wave, so 90 degrees. What will happen in the rotating frame? This magnetic field will point a long way. So we have another picture to draw here uh, in three dimensions and we can discuss what's happening there. So once again, if we have our initial direction on Z, like so. That's the magnetic moment. Now, in the rotating frame, our magnetic field will point along Y. So, that way. That's our V1 in the rotating frame. And, OK, corkscrew, to make it move in the direction of V1, we need to rotate our mu on to the positive direction of the x-axis. So it will go there and it will land in the xy plane if we time it right. Of course, what's going to happen if we do not time it right is the rotation will either be incomplete or it would be overcomplete. If the pulse is too short, then we might land somewhere here. If the pulse is too long, we will go partially in the negative direction of the z-axis. So we could, in principle, complete the rotation and end up there. 
or if we really want to burn our capacitors, we could give a really long pulse, which will do a complete revolution around the direction of the B1 and perhaps a few revolutions. And this is all possible and this is all done for various reasons in magnetic resonance. So finally, let us consider what the instrument is going to see when we do that. We have tilted the magnetization. So let us draw the following. That will be the length of the pulse. So tau, pulse length. And this will be the signal. I will tell you in the following lectures how that signal is actually acquired, processed and plotted. But you all know how an NMR signal looks. It's a pick that sticks out of the baseline. It's quite sharp really uniquely sharp for electromagnetic spectroscopy. You know that in infrared and certainly optical lines are nowhere near as sharp as they are in magnetic resonance. And let us start at zero. Now this is our zero zero in a situation when we did not give any pulse at all. Of course everything just starts off pointing on the z-axis. The coils pick up nothing and there is no signal. Then we give it a pulse which is uh, finite but only produces a tiny flip angle. Most of it remains on the z-axis, a little bit ends up in the xy plane. We do see a little bit of signal, so there will be a peak. Then if we give it a longer pulse, the peak would grow and then grow again. And because we have a cos and a sine, what will happen is this will follow a cosine curve. So it will keep growing and it will reach a maximum when our pulse is just long enough for all magnetization to end up in the transverse plane. But then, of course, what is going to happen is we will keep tilting it and so less of it will end up in the transverse plane and then even less. And then finally, when we have rotated it full 180 degrees, there's nothing left in the transverse plane, the signal will go to zero again. But then what's going to happen is we will tilt it all the way until a situation comes when we are pointing on the negative direction of the x-axis and so the magnetization will turn negative. The phase will be flipped and so you will have these negative signals and so on. And onwards into positive and onwards into negative. This is called a mutation diagram. And this is useful for two things. Firstly, it is very important in a lot of NMR experiments to know which duration of the pulse produces precisely a 90 degrees rotation. This is 90 degrees here, pi by two. This is because a lot of NMR experiments involve long trains of pulses that must manipulate magnetization direction and a few other things really precisely. And of course, every sample has a different magnetic susceptibility, every probe has a different coil geometry. The power of the amplifier depends on things like room temperature. Every time we walk into the NMR facility, we roughly know what the duration is of this 90 degrees pulse between 5 and 10 microseconds. Normally, at the maximum power that the amplifier can give us, but we need to calibrate it. And so the first thing that every NMR spectroscopist does before they begin their experiment is produce this mutation diagram, find out where the maximum is and read off the corresponding duration. Okay. 
this is of course pi by 2 pulse and the tau is roughly 5 microseconds. What is also occasionally handy here is to convert this time and that angle back into the amplitude of the B1 field. And that was the last problem in the workshop that you've seen when we asked ourselves, okay, we know that phosphorus 31 tips 90 degrees in a certain length of time. What is the B1 field? And that's quite easy to establish. So our angular frequency, remember radians per second, is the amount of radians we have divided by the amount of time it has taken. And so that is the tilt angle here, alpha, divided by the time it has taken to tilt it. We have it in radians per second. We then know that omega 1 is minus gamma v1, so divided by the magnetogyric ratio, and that is the field that those coils produce, typically in the millitesla range. So this is how these notation pictures are produced and analyzed. The other important thing that they do is they tell us how good the instrument actually is. Imagine we have a low quality capacitor in the probe that arcs essentially the potential difference between the two plates of the capacitor is high enough for there to be an electrical breakthrough through the dielectric, which occasionally happens with low quality cups. Of course, for a short pulse that wouldn't manifest and it wouldn't manifest and it wouldn't manifest. And then at some point, the electrical arcing will throw off the circuit frequency, will cause the power loss. And so suddenly all of this picture will go haywire and become unpredictable. So we know, aha, uh -huh, something is wrong electrically. Or if the B1 field is not homogeneous, the coil is poorly designed, what will happen is different parts of the sample will see different flipping angles. And of course, if spins end up all over in the direction, the average direction, right, the average becomes smaller. And so this notation curve will start decaying. And so a measure of how well it looks, how slowly it decays is um, a way to determine the quality of the electronics and the probe. Early probes could really do about three or four overall rotations. Modern probes can occasionally manage dozens, so the manipulation of the spin is quite precise in them. Okay, so these are the radio frequency pulses and this is what they do. So to give you a few illustrations, and this is used a lot in MRI where magnetization must be manipulated quite precisely. Let us design ourselves a pulse sequence that would first rotate us 90 degrees onto the x-axis, then turn us in the negative direction of the y-axis, then rotate us into the negative direction of the z-axis, and then uh, return us to the original location. And this would be a simple single spin pulse sequence, as it's called. And let us build a little table over here. So that will be phase and that would be effect of the corresponding pulse. So, the way it's drawn is we write the nucleus label, 1H. We draw a line and the representation logically, right, historically, came from how the picture looks if you connect an oscilloscope to the instrument. So imagine we have a scope, we have connected the output 
of our um, amplifier through an attenuator usually so as not to destroy the scope and we start looking at the picture with microsecond time resolution it would look something like this so it will just be a solid block of signal this is because in reality of course the signal oscillates very rapidly but the resolution of early oscilloscopes and most of the oscilloscopes today is actually insufficient to pick out individual waves in that pulse and so it just looks like a solid block the way it's annotated is we say it's pi by 2 and let's give it the x phase so phase plus x which means that in the rotating frame, our magnetic field points in the x direction and we gave it enough time and enough amplitude, remember we can alter B1 as well, so as to produce a 90 degrees rotation. Okay, so effect, rotation around x towards and let's take a look at how it rotates this is our picture so when the field was on the x-axis you can see it rotates in the negative direction of the y-axis so towards minus y that's the effect and uh, perhaps we should start making another figure here so we coordinate system z y x our initial condition is along the z axis and our first rotation is on to the negative direction of the y axis so like that and the tip of the vector will land here. What we can now do is simply allow the system to evolve. We just sit and do nothing for a certain period delta t. What is going to happen is these spins will precess. And in the rotating frame, we are at exactly the frequency of this particular spin but perhaps its neighbor has a different chemical shift in which case its frequency will be slightly different from the frequency of our rotating frame and it would be able to rotate if we give it just enough time so let's say we have another spin with frequency omega zero b and that frequency is ever so slightly different. And we are looking at Z spin. Let's call it mu B. Then, of course, during the waiting period, it would slowly drift. And maybe if its chemical shift difference has the correct sign, it would drift in that direction. So it would then rotate here. So this rotation had happened in the ZY plane. This rotation is happening in the xy plane. Our spin tip will land here. And then we'll give it another pulse. Also a 90. So this is how it will look in an oscilloscope. Again, pi by 2. But we want to rotate it to the negative direction of the z-axis. And to do that, we need to rotate that spin around the y-axis. So this will be pi by 2y. Uh, so let's fill in this table plus y. If we are here, corkscrew rule, if the field is on y, we are rotating onto the negative direction of the z-axis so that way and let's finish drawing it here what will happen is it will go deep under this plane 
and it will rotate like that. So if we do Y, we have a rotation around Y. And if we start, for example, at Z, we will rotate in the positive direction of X. So towards plus X. And finally, let us return our spin to where we found it. And let us again give it a pulse along the x direction. We can wait however we want, however long we want here. The pulse is on the z, spin is on the z. It is not going to precess. Right? It sits just opposite to the magnet. It will slowly relax, but that's the topic of the next lecture. So we can wait for however long we want in here. And then we will give it another pulse, but it will be twice as long, or twice as powerful. So that pulse will accomplish a pi rotation, and let us apply the corresponding magnetic field in the positive direction of the x-axis. X. So we've got rotation around x, so like that in this direction so what will happen is this spin will rotate all the way back and into its original place these sequences of rotations are quite common uh, that is not unusual in magnetic resonance you will see a few examples of what they're useful for in the next lecture. But let us complete our table here. So if we give a pulse in the minus x phase, which simply means the magnetic field points in the negative direction of the x-axis, then we will be rotating around x, x, but towards plus y if we start at z. And finally, if we give it a minus y pulse, so that's around y, towards the negative direction of the x-axis if we start at z. In essence, by giving the system radio frequency pulses and by carefully calibrating delays, we can manipulate the magnetization vector in an arbitrary way. We can point it anywhere we like in three dimensions, extremely precisely. These days, modern instrument, well calibrated, well compensated with a well characterized spin system, we can push the magnetization around to within a fraction of a percent. This is why NMR is so powerful as an analytical technique. Firstly, despite the fact that 600 megahertz sounds like a lot, on the scale of what modern electronics can do, this is actually quite slow. Uh, we can dance around literally that spin with various electromagnetic fields on that time scale. Uh, we are quite lucky. For example, laser spectroscopists uh, have five or six orders of magnitude faster dynamics. For them, it's a serious challenge. For us, thankfully, at least in NMR, it isn't. And uh, this precision is uh, one of the chief reasons why NMR is so popular. OK, so summary of the lecture. We've introduced a fairly central concept in magnetic resonance called rotating frame. View it as gluing a web camera on one of the spins. And so the motion of that particular spin and of all the surrounding spins of the same type slows down significantly when you look through that camera. What is particularly important is that oscillating magnetic fields in the laboratory frame become static magnetic fields in the rotating frame, allowing us to use simple geometric intuition about how to manipulate the magnetization. Then there's the concept of notation diagram. It's when you start acting with that radio frequency magnetic field for different periods of time. So you are rotating the magnetization from where it originally sits, which is along the magnet, to differing extents into the transverse plane where the magnetization is detectable. 
if the pulse is very short you have a little the longer the pulse gets the closer to 90 degrees you get the greater the signal you're going to get but if you overdo it you start departing from the xy plane and so the signal diminishes when you end up on the minus z the signal becomes zero because there's nothing in the transverse plane and so on it continues and this notation diagram is used for pulse calibration and for probe quality analysis you will see a lot of this in our subsequent lectures this picture is how it looks on the oscilloscope and about half of NMR papers would use that notation the other half will make them look like this so essentially nothing goes below the baseline but that's just a different way of representing the same thing okay um, that's it for today any questions?